What's up, everybody? I'm Pastor Jordan. This is my wife, Janae. And we're so excited that you're joining us today. Whether you're in person or online, we believe here at VIA that every single person matters. We believe everyone was created by God, and we know He wants to move powerfully in every single one of our lives. Yeah, so whether you're joining us for the very first time, welcome to you, or you're coming back for the hundredth time, we believe that God has a reason for you being here. We're so excited to encounter Him today, and so let's dive in. Morning. Good morning. Well, hey, I'm so glad you're here. I haven't had a chance to meet you. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here at Via Church and uh, want to welcome everybody, but especially our first time guests this morning and those of you who joined for the child dedications. It's really cool. And one of, one of the things you may not know about Via Church, but I think it's such a beautiful thing is that we believe that we serve the God of every generation, right? So we have grandbabies, babies, parents, grandparents, all together, right? All in one place, all worshiping the same God, right? The Old Testament calls God the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's faithful to every generation, right? And so I believe that you're here for a reason today. You're here for a purpose. No matter how young or old you are, God never changes. He's always faithful, right? His love, his truth is for every generation. Culture might change, but God doesn't. And so we're here to celebrate that today. Um, also, something I wanna mention about that is we're, we're a church that really values the next generation and Pastor Joe, um, who was up here earlier with Sean A, that next week they're actually uh, taking 280 kids up to camp, okay? They leave tomorrow morning. And so I just really want to encourage you as a church to be praying for them, to be encouraging them. Um, so much hard work has gone into that. And I know for me, even looking back on my faith journey, like, that camp as a teenager can be such a powerful time, right? So we're praying that our, our students, our youth would just have a powerful encounter with God that would transform them. And I also wanna thank just the generosity of many people in our church because Joe let me know that uh, 24 kids were fully sponsored uh, to go to camp over the last couple of weeks. So I thank you guys for stepping up to do that, to provide an opportunity for kids you know, who maybe didn't have the money to still be able to go to camp and just have an awesome week. So we're really excited about that. Joe's gonna share a little bit more about that next week. Um, and then in two weeks from now, we're kicking off a new series. So I'd encourage you guys to come back. All right, so I'm gonna pray for our time together and, and we'll dig into it. So Lord, I thank you so much for everybody who's here. I thank you for who you are, for your faithfulness to us, that no matter what we've been going through this week, that we can come here today, open up your word, open up your truth. And I just trust that it'll hit all of us powerfully. Like we're all coming from different places, but I believe that you have a word for all of us this morning. So I pray that you would just get me out of the way, put Jesus on full display in this house, show us how good you are, show us how faithful you are, encourage us and challenge us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. All right, well I've got a good word for you guys today and uh, the title of my message it will kind of show you where we're going here. It's called Trust in the Testing. Trust in the Testing. So hopefully you showed up with your seatbelt buckled, you know, ready to go. Um, but we're gonna be in Daniel chapter six. So if you got a Bible or be up on the screens as well, I wanna encourage you, Daniel chapter six. This is a story that you probably, if you grew up in church at all, you probably heard it in Sunday school. Uh, the story of Daniel and the lion's den. But hopefully we'll be able to mine out some new things from that for you this morning. So uh, if you guys have a Bible, just rip into it. Like I said, it'll be up on the screen. So we're in Daniel chapter six, beginning right in verse one. And it says, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. And the king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and to protect the king's interests. And Daniel soon proved himself to be more capable than all the other administrators and all the other high officers. And because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Okay, so the context for this, like if, if you haven't spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, you might know that early on in Genesis, God made a promise to this guy named Abraham, right? And, and the covenant and the promise that God made with Abraham is that through his descendants would be a great nation. And the nation not only consists of people, but it also consisted of a place. That these nomadic people 
would have a land. And so God brings them into the land. That's what Joshua is all about. And they cross the river. They, they get into the land and as they're in the land and as they establish a society and as they take a king, even though God said you shouldn't have a king like the, all the other nations, but they want a king. And, and so what happens is the people of God are unfaithful to God. And as a result of their sin, they experience multiple times throughout their history um, being exiled into a foreign land. And so in this situation, uh, the people of Israel were un, uh, unfaithful and a foreign army came and conquered them and took them into Babylon. Right, so they're in ba Babylon, which is the most powerful nation on the earth, and the, the person in charge at the time, Darius, decided that he's gonna break it up into different provinces as a large kingdom. He's gonna appoint different leaders over each area, but then those people would have leaders above them, right? And so this young man named Daniel, a Jewish boy, right, God puts him in a position within Darius's cabinet, and Daniel proves himself to be faithful and he proves his great ability. And here, what I wanna say about this is when God puts you in a position, and this is really important, it doesn't have to be a position that you view as a high position, okay? Because it's important to remember in this text that Daniel didn't start in this place, right? Joseph, when he got called up to be um, among the Pharaoh, like he didn't start there, right? Nobody starts in a place of high position, and yet, no matter what position God has put you in, your position is an opportunity to represent him, right? To represent him to other people, to represent him to the world. And so really the question is like, what kind of representation are we giving, right? And you don't represent, you don't represent God well by telling all the people around you, hey, here's who my God is, he's so great. Like that, that's cool to speak with your words, but the way people actually uh, understand who your God is is by what you're representing with your life. And so Daniel, he didn't just talk about his God. Daniel, no matter where he went, whether his situation was difficult or whether he was elevated, he represented God by living out his faith and having so much integrity and so much ability that even the people around him who didn't know his God were like, we wanna put this person in charge because he's trustworthy. Right, we wanna put this person in charge because he's faithful. And so I believe that as believers, we should stand out in the world in a positive way, right? We should excel to the point where people around us say, okay, I don't, I don't understand the God that he serves, but I know he's a person of integrity, I know he's faithful, I know he's, he has ability, she has ability, and so I'm gonna entrust them in this position. And so verse four says this, it says, then the other administrators and the other high officers began searching for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling his government affairs. Okay, so this is a word for somebody today because you would think that a person of integrity, a person of faith, a person who is highly skilled would just be super popular with everybody around them, right? But how many of you know that when God puts you in a position, whether you're faithful or whether you're not, you're gonna have critics? And when you walk with God and you walk with integrity and you walk with faithfulness and you walk in truth, you're still gonna experience opposition, right? It, sometimes just you living faithfully the way God has called you to live will stir up jealousy in other people and a desire to cut you down and a desire to credit, uh, discredit you, right? This is nothing new. I mean, this happened before social media, before TMZ, before news, you know, before any of that people had a desire to cut down and discredit those who were faithful to the Lord. And, and think about it, it's, the reason is because it's not you they're discrediting, it's the God that you serve. And so Daniel experiences opposition even though he had done nothing wrong. But here's what's really powerful, what sets Daniel apart here is not so much that the people around him are criticizing him, but it's what they find when they're looking for the dirt. Look at this in verse four. This is so powerful. It says, they were searching for a fault in the way that Daniel was handling his government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or to condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. How cool is this? So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Okay, here's a question for you this morning. If somebody was really trying to slander you, like they were trying to find everything they could find, what would they find? 
I mean, this is a safe place. We're in church this morning. We could be honest. I mean, if you're like me, you get a little bit nervous, right? Because there's a lot of stuff people could find. I mean, th- think about that. If somebody's whole job was to investigate you, to try to find stuff that other people don't know, they're like, okay, we're gonna interview all of their closest relationships. We're gonna look through their internet browser history. We're, we're gonna check out their bank accounts and see what's been going on in their financial dealings, in their business. You don't think anybody would find anything about you? And thank God for his mercy and grace, right? That covers over our sins and mistakes. But, but how cool is it that when they look through Daniel's history and they were looking for places of dishonesty and they were looking for places of hypocrisy, the only thing they could find was he's really sold out to God. Like what they're saying is not that he was perfect, but listen, this person is so pure and, and holy and in alignment and walking in integrity and excellency, that there isn't this huge secret to find. There isn't this hidden dirt that we can find on him. And so the only thing we really have on him is we know that he has so much trust in God that he will follow him completely, even if it gets him in trouble. And so maybe we can use that to trap him. Like, isn't that, wouldn't that be cool to strive for that? That the people around you, it doesn't matter what kind of criticisms they label you with. Like, what they're gonna find is that you're a follower of Jesus, that you represent him, and you represent him well, right? And, and so the, I, I think the point is not this pressure to be perfect, but it's the reminder that other people are watching our life, right? We, we're a witness for Christ to the people around us. And, and so regardless of Daniel's integrity, he still faced opposition. It's nothing we should be surprised by, right? I think some of us think if I just, if I have my life together, if I'm really following God, then you know, things are gonna be good. Things will be smooth. But that, that's not the way it works, right? You, you're gonna experience opposition and criticism, whether it's coming as a result of your lack of faithfulness to God or whether it's coming as a result of your faithfulness to God. And so it's better to choose uh, the path of criticism that comes as a result of living a life of faith. Like, the way I said it here is that opposition is often a sign of obedience, Right? It's not always a sign of disobedience. If you're really following Jesus, not everybody is gonna like you. And you don't have to get discouraged by that because you know that when the criticisms come and the struggle comes, it's not always a sign you're on the wrong path. Jesus, all the prophets, everyone who followed after Christ, they had an enemy that opposed them, right? They they had critics in their life in fact, look at what Jesus said in, in John 15, 18. He said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Right, like this is nothing new. I mean, part of what it literally means to, to walk in the way of Jesus is to experience what Jesus experienced, which isn't popularity. Like think about that. The, the only one who's ever perfect, the only one who's truly without sin Jesus, the only one who truly, if you investigated his whole record, there's nothing to find, right? Other than perfect trust and obedience in the Father. He, he was not appreciated by everybody. He, he experienced so much criticism, but this is what's really important. I think this is important in the context uh, where we live because this passage where you know Daniel rises to this prominence and he's excellent in all he does and these people are trying to find dirt on him, remember that Daniel is in a foreign land, right? And he's serving a pagan king. And most of the Old Testament is like that where the people of God are actually in captivity. They're in another nation, a nation that doesn't follow their God, doesn't follow their religion, right? And even after Jesus, for the first several hundred years before Constantine, every single Christian across the planet was living in a culture that didn't promote following Jesus as the major religion. In fact, they experienced persecution and hardship all the time, like real persecution, not just someone's gonna look at you funny because you invited them to church, like the kind of persecution that says if you walk with Jesus, you might lose your relationships with your family. If you make a decision for Jesus, it might cost you your life. And here's the thing is I'm not trying to glorify persecution, but I'm saying that even in those situations where God's people were put in, in places and lands that were not favorable to their faith, it never slowed down what God was doing. In fact, the church always explodes under pressure 
in a positive way, right? Like multiplication, purity, get, getting back to what really matters. And, and so again, like I'm saying, I'm not trying to glorify persecution. I'm very, very grateful this morning for the freedoms and the safety that we have to worship God in this place. But I wonder sometimes, as American Christians, if we have maybe lost our way because we have become so accustomed to people who claim to be believers being in charge or demanding that our culture gets in line with our values. And so maybe sometimes when we think we're being hated because we're following Jesus, I wonder sometimes, are we always hated because we're following Jesus or are we hated because we're being inconsistent or hypocritical in the way we follow Jesus. Rich Villalotos, who just wrote a new book on the Sermon on the Mount, it's called The Narrow Path. Um, he said it this way, he said, do we have enemies in our life because we're following the upside down kingdom values of Jesus? Or do we have them because we're living inconsistent with the way of Jesus? Right, you, you have to discern that because there's an enemy making that comes, and by the way, Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, right? But there's an enemy making that comes from just faithfully living out the gospel. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just being faithful to the Lord. And, and yet not everybody's going to appreciate or understand that. Okay? But there's also an enemy making that comes when you act in a way that doesn't resemble Jesus. And the people around you notice that or try to tell you that. And then you blame it on them and say, look at how faithful I am. Look at all these people hating on me because of my faith. Right? And so Jesus wants us to make enemies not because of our immaturity, but because our character resembles him, right? It's a, it's a very different thing. Like, let, let me put it this way. Like, Jesus, who is the perfect son of God, he offended a lot of people, but you ever paid attention to what he did to offend them and who he offended? Because notice, you know who Jesus offended the most by far? Religious people and people in political power because he was a threat, right? He was a threat to their security. And so what did Jesus offend people for? He, he offended people when he refused to pick up a sword in retaliation, and instead he healed. He offended people when he healed in the wrong way, the wrong people, on the wrong day, right? He offended people when he called out religious people for their greed and hypocrisy, Jesus would get angry, and, and people didn't like that. He, he told religious people that sinners and tax collectors were entering the kingdom of God before they were. That's a good way to rile up a crowd, right? And, and, and he offended them when he said that maybe God's message of grace and good news is extending beyond just the people you had in mind. Maybe, maybe the Gentiles were being grafted in to the nation of Israel, not just this one people, maybe this person that you've cast aside. Like, have you thought about the, the, the parable of the good Samaritan? I mean, talk about offensive. Jesus is literally saying, the person that you think is the bad guy is actually the person who loved his neighbor, and the person that should have done something about it is the person who walked right on by, right? These are the things that Jesus would regularly do, championing the poor and the outcast, teaching controversial things that didn't line up with the traditional interpretation of scripture so it upset religious people. But listen, he spoke with so much authority that they couldn't deny the truth, right? And, and so this is what Jesus was, uh, why he was a threat. And so what I'm trying to say is, are we getting criticized for being faithfully like Jesus? Or are we getting criticized for the opposite, right? And it's just something to reflect on. But I, I love this, so let's get back into the text. I'm gonna get off my soapbox, okay? All right, verse 19. It says this. Or sorry, verse 11. I, I went to the wrong spot, my bad. It says, then the officials went together to Daniel's house. Nope, I'm so in the wrong place, my bad, guys. This is why you shouldn't have notes. Okay, here we go. All right, verse six. So the administrators and the high officers, they went to the king and they said, long leave, live King Darius. We're all in agreement, right? The administrators, the officials, the high officers, the advisors, the governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. And so 
give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anybody, divine or human, except to you, your majesty will be thrown into the den of lions. And now your majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed in an official law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be revoked. And so King Darius signed the law. So here's what's happening is the people who are closest to the king are convincing the king to go after Daniel by signing this law. They're actually kind of tricking him. And this is, by the way, the way that power works is the way that people in power try to manipulate situations is they appeal to each other's vanity. So they trick the king by saying, king, you're the best. You're the greatest. We love you. We serve you. You know what would be a good idea? What if you issued a decree for 30 days that nobody could worship anybody except for you? Right? And he's like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. You know? I am the king. And so it says in, um, that, that he passed the law, right? Now, Watch this in verse 10. This is so powerful. It says, but when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, so he was well aware of what happened, right? He went home and he knelt down, notice this, as usual in his upstairs room with its window open towards Jerusalem and he prayed three times a day just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. I, guys, I love this so much because not only was Daniel completely undeterred, right, by the opposition and by the threat of power that was coming at him. But notice this, that when Daniel went back and he prayed to his Lord and he had this, this habit of praying three times a day, it was nothing new, right? He was just doing what he had always done. I, I think there's such a powerful word for somebody in this today because I, I wanna tell you that your regular practices in your life, they prepare you for the challenges ahead. Right, you, you don't know what's coming, but the character and the practices you're building into your life are shaping how you're gonna respond when the challenges come. And a lot of people have this idea, right, that they wanna go out and do big things for God, they wanna see miracles, that, that they're just gonna step up and, and have faith and perseverance in difficult situations, but they're not obedient right now in the small things. And I love that the text says that Daniel didn't do anything new. He just did what he had always done. And so you can write this down if you're a note taker. This is kind of the big takeaway here is what will actually come out in the moments of testing is not what you intend to do. It's what you practice to do. You hear me? Like when you get to that moment that you may or may not be in right now, that's that uncomfortable testing moment. What's gonna come out in that moment is not what you intend to do, it's what you practice to do. That's huge because I think for so many of us, right, testing is a revealer. Things get harder under pressure and when things are under pressure, then it exposes what was underneath, right? I think about this, I'm a golfer, not a very good one, but by way of analogy, I always joke um, that if they had like a PGA Tour for mulligans, I would be on it. And what I mean by that is my first shot when it actually counts is not usually very good, but then when I'm upset about that shot and I just hit one without a, thinking about it, it's always great, you know? Because it's not that hard when there's no pressure. But if you watch the professionals, right, on the PGA and L LPGA Tour, like it's crazy. I was watching this video of Bryson DeChambeau. He's from Clovis, right? He's one of the best players in the world. And he was playing uh, with some amateur golfers and every time he had a putt that was like really short, they were like, oh, that's good. Like, just pick it up. We know you can make that. He would, he would putt it out every time. Why? Because it's practice. Because he knows that when there's pressure on and when everyone's watching you on TV and there's millions of dollars on the line, that two foot putt is hard. And what prepares you for that moment is the fact that you practice it thousands of times before you were under pressure. And I wonder if sometimes there's a lesson for us in the life of faith that if we want to be in that moment and we want to excel in that moment, then it's like, how are we practicing for that right now, right? What does it look like for you right now in your situation today to be obedient and faithful so that when the testing comes, you'll be faithful, right? We can't, we can't just expect like it's just gonna happen. Um, look at this, verse 11, it says, then the officials, they went together to Daniel's house. They found him praying, right? They found him breaking the decree, asking for God's help. And so they went straight to the king and they reminded him about his law, 
right? They're like, did you not sign this law that for the next 30 days, anybody who prays to anybody except you will be thrown in a den of lions? And the king, he doesn't know about Daniel yet, right? So he's like, yeah, I know about that. I signed that for sure. If anybody breaks that law, they're gonna die. And then they told the king, notice this, that man, Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, he's ignoring you and he's ignoring your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. And look at this in verse 14. This is really interesting. It says, upon hearing this, the king was deeply troubled and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. And he spent the rest of the day trying to look for a way to get Daniel out of his predicament. Isn't that powerful that the king who didn't even worship God that got tricked into passing this decree, when Daniel breaks his decree, he's so grieved because he didn't mean it to harm Daniel because he has so much respect for him because of the faithfulness that he's shown that he's trying to find a way to get out of it. But isn't it also a reminder, and this is important for us as believers, especially in our our day and age, is to remember that even when you think you have an enemy, our enemy is not people, right? Paul says it this way. He says, we we don't fight against people. our, our, Our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers. So the point is, Daniel was going through testing and the king was just a part of a bigger story. And when God puts you in a position, like there is going to be an attack, the, the enemy doesn't like that. And, and so your battle is not against other people. Even the one that was used to put Daniel in this predicament couldn't stop it, right? He, he didn't even know what was happening. He wanted to find a way out of it. But then look at this, is continuing in the text of verse 13. It's really powerful. So in the evening, the men come back to the king and they're like, you know you can't do anything about this, right? You, you know you can't change the law because... If the king signed it, even the king can't change it. And so look at this, verse 16, it says, so at last the king gave the orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And I love this. The king said, may your God, whom you serve faithfully, rescue you. See, this is a situation that's so impossible that even the king who doesn't follow God, he understands that what I know about Daniel, besides the fact that he's excellent in all he does, is I know that he's faithful to his God. And so I sure hope that his God can do something for him in this situation, right? And isn't it true that it doesn't matter what people think, it doesn't matter where they're at in their faith, I think there's a part of every person that deep down inside actually wants to know, is this God that you're talking about actually real? Is that God that you talk about and you proclaim and you say you're going to church on Sunday to sing songs to him and, you know, open this Bible that you say talks about him. Like, is he really real though? Like, does he really show up for you when you need him? Can he really show up for me? See, that that's something that people are always hungry to believe. And so even this pagan king who didn't know the God of Daniel says, I really hope that your God can rescue you. And so look at this, verse 17. This is crazy. The king, I guess, just wanted to make sure that this impossible situation was truly impossible. So he said he took a stone, they placed it over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and with the seals of the nobles so that nobody could rescue Daniel. So they're like, look, Daniel's in the lion's den. Lions kill people. That's what they do, right? Like, I mean, literally, this is what happened thousands of years later. They would feed Christians to lions in the Colosseum. So he's like, we're putting him in this den. There are lions in there. The lions will devour him. And just in case he thinks he can escape or somebody else is going to come rescue him, we're going to roll this huge stone. We're going to put the king's seal on it, which means if anybody messes with it, they know they're going to be executed, right? But then look at this, verse 18. It says, the king returned to his palace and he spent all night fasting. Isn't that crazy? Like, he was so grieved because he had so much, so much honor and, and so much, like, appreciation for who Daniel was that even though he felt like he had to do this, like, he was grieved over it. And he said he refused his usual entertainment and he couldn't sleep at all that night. Like, he was just anxious. And then check this out, verse 19. This is super cool. It says, very early the next morning, the king got up. He hurried out to the lion's den. And when he got there, he called out in anguish, right? Because he's probably afraid about what he was going to see. He said, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God who you serve so faithfully able to rescue you from the lions? 
Like I said, I believe this is a question people are still asking, right? Here's the thing. Some of us have a lot of what I call keyboard courage, but (laughs) that may or may not be changing anybody's mind around you. And the real question is, do you actually have trust in how big your God is? And what are the people around you actually seeing? Because here's Daniel in this impossible situation where he's condemned to die and nobody can do anything about it. And the king is like, Daniel, are you there? Was the God that you serve faithfully able to protect you? Like he knows that if there's any way Daniel gets out of the situation, there's no way it was Daniel. Only God could do that. And I just wonder sometimes if God wants to put us in situations where only he's capable of turning it around, right? Look at verse 21. It says, Daniel answered. He said, long live the king. My God has sent his angels to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight and I have not wronged you your majesty, the king. And so the king was so overjoyed and he ordered that Daniel be lifted up from the den and not, this is so cool, not a scratch was found on him for he had trusted in his God. See, here's what I wanna say about this is trusting God doesn't always make sense. It's not always easy. But when you trust God, like in, in an area that seems impossible and difficult, that's an opportunity for God to show up in a different way. Right, like, let me say it this way. I wonder if sometimes we're actually running away from the miracle because the place where God is truly ready to show up and receive his glory is the place that we're scared of and avoiding. Because that's the place that only God can get the credit, right? That's the place where where you actually have to trust him. And I wonder if sometimes we want to see the miraculous in our life, but we don't actually ever want to be in situations where we have to trust God. That's what I was saying. Jesus warned about this all the time, by the way. It's not that I'm ungrateful at all. I'm very grateful uh, for being in this place and and in this culture. But at the same time, the, the Bible and Jesus warned consistently about the trappings of wealth, the trappings of comfort. Why? Because when you think you don't need anything, because you have everything, then you don't trust God. Right? Like, it's it's. Hard to trust God when you think you don't need him. But when you're in a situation where it's either God is gonna show up or it's not gonna go well for you, that's an opportunity not just for a miracle, but it's an opportunity to witness to the people around you. And maybe this will change the way you pray and maybe change the, what you pray for or change the way you trust. But I, I want you to think about this, that maybe that, that thing that you're so afraid of, that area you're avoiding is actually the place that God wants to show up the most. And when God does a miracle in those places of our life, the truth is the miracle isn't just for you. The miracle is a witness to the world because what God cares about most is his glory, right? Like miracles aren't just about us. It's about God's glory. It's about the kingdom. It's about the people around you who don't know him, who will come to know him. It's about the community and the culture being impacted. Like, like I said, people can deny anything. Like, it's funny. I watch these people in arguments on, you know, social media, not a good thing to observe. And, and it's like, people are throwing facts and we can't even agree on if it's a fact or not. And even if they think it's a fact, it's still not gonna change their mind. But you know what people can't deny? It is when God has worked in a powerful way in somebody's life, in a way that is so obvious that even the king is like, what just happened, right? And so I wonder if maybe God is inviting you into some opportunities where you have to trust him. Like, think about this. Before God parted the Red Sea, he told Moses to reach out his staff towards the water. And you know how dumb you look if you do that and nothing happens, (laughs) right? Have you ever thought about that? Like before God called fire down from heaven, the prophet Elijah had to take on the most powerful false prophets in the world. Like he's gonna, his life is threatened if it doesn't work. Like before the, the, the angelic army showed up to help Israel, Israel had to show up on the battlefield knowing that they were completely outnumbered and they had no chance of winning without help. And again, I just wonder sometimes if we're limiting 
what God wants to do because we're afraid to show up in the places where he's about to show out. Where it's just like, God, I don't wanna trust you like that because what if the lions eat me, <laughs> right? And, and, and he's saying, listen, that place is, is, a, is the birth ground of miracles and it's the opportunity to witness. So look at this in verse 24. It says, then the king gave orders to arrest all the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. So Daniel survived. The king is like, this is incredible. Uh, the God of Daniel has rescued him. And then notice that all the people who were trying to take out Daniel now they're all about to get taken out. I mean, this is very Old Testament, but check, it says the king had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children, and the lions leaped on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. They probably cut that out of the Sunday school lesson, like the little <laughs> flannel board, but um, the, the point is, okay, this is Old Testament, but here, here's the point. The point is that Sometimes we're trying to fight so hard for ourselves, and, and Paul says it this way in the New Testament. He says, vengeance is, is for the Lord. You don't need to take vengeance. We don't serve the Jesus who retaliated. We serve the Jesus who was mocked and spit upon. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And so what I'm trying to say is, you don't have to fight against every hard situation. You can trust the God who fights for you. And he's not a God who's mocked, and he's not a God who's just gonna allow injustice forever. He's a just and righteous God, right? And, and even the things that are meant to harm you, God can work them out for good. And the things that were taken away can be restored. And, and the people who are against you can be humbled, right? Like, look at verse 25, it says, then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and every nation in every language throughout the world. Isn't that cool? Like what Daniel did in one place in one location that, that the people around him tried to destroy, destroy him actually now became a witness, not just to that area, but every person, every language group, every person on the planet heard about this. And we're still reading about it thousands of years later, right? And so this is what King Darius decreed. It says, peace and prosperity to you. I decree that Everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he will endure forever, and his kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and during the reign of Cyrus. Just like Joseph, right? God took this impossible situation that others intended for harm, and he used it not only for Daniel's good, but for the good of the nations. Like, isn't that crazy what God can do? How he can turn around an impossible situation that literally the king who created a law that said you could only worship me, that after God showed up, he said, not only am I not God, and I think we should all serve the God of Daniel, right? Everybody in the whole world, because he's the one who's truly powerful. He's the one whose reign will never end. He's the one who will always be king, no matter who's in the White House, no matter who's on the throne, no matter who's in power in any place in the world. The one who's ultimately in control is the king of all kings, right? And, and so he turns this challenging situation into a witness, into a platform. And I just wonder again if some of the most powerful miracles you're running away from and if some of the most powerful stories that God wants to share about your life to the people around you are in places that you're avoiding, right? And so where I wanna end this message today is just real simple. I wanna challenge you and I wanna invite you this morning. If God puts it on your heart, right? If he's, if he's knocking at your door, I really want you to ask this question of where do I need to trust God in my life? Like, God, where are you calling me to trust you today? And, and maybe for you, maybe it, it means trusting him for the first time. Like, maybe you showed up to church today, you've never even made that decision, right? To, to place your life in God's hands, to follow Christ, to, to say, Lord, I need you, I need your help, right? I can't just live for myself. Like, I, I can't just be righteous on my own. I need you to forgive my sins. I, I need your Holy Spirit. I need your love and your peace in my life, right? Like if that's you, maybe the first place you start 
is it's just by trusting him for the first time today. The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, right? With a genuine heart, you just reach out and you say, Lord, I need you. And then for those of us who've been following him for a long time, I wonder if God is asking you to step out into a new place of trust this morning so that he could show up in your life in an even more powerful way. And not just for you, but for all the people around you, right? That we would see not ourselves, but that we would look at what God has done, even in difficult situations, and we just say, surely that's the God of Daniel, that's the God of Abraham, that's the God of Isaac, that's the God of Jacob. This is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. Like, he's the God of every generation. He's the God who's always faithful. He's the God who's always good. Like, let's trust him. Let's serve him. Right? That's what the world needs. Amen? The, the world needs a witness. And I believe that God is giving us an opportunity today to just start by trusting him one step at a time with those small practices so that when we get tested, right, he can show up. So let me pray for us this morning. Lord, I thank you for who you are. You're, you're the God over it all. You're the God of every nation. And God, I pray this morning that you would just deepen our trust, that we would leave today just more in awe of who you are. And that the story of Daniel, that we would realize that it's not just a story that we read about in an old book, like the God of Daniel is still the God of today. You're still the God that we serve. You're the God that we worship this morning. You're the God who's still speaking, the God who speaks through his word, the God who's living and active, who's given us your spirit, who's given us your son. And so, Lord, I pray today for anybody who doesn't know you that this morning would be a marked moment, that they would call on you with genuineness of heart and say, Lord, I, I repent of my sins. I'm tired of doing it my own way. I want to trust in you today. And for those of us who've been walking with you for a while, I pray that this would be an encouragement and a challenge today, that no matter who's against us, no matter what's going on around us, no matter what's going on in culture, that we would trust you, that we would be faithful to you, that the people around us would not talk about us, but they'd talk about our God and how good he is, right? That even in the scary places, even the places we don't wanna trust you today, that as we trust you, in the most difficult situations that you would show up in the most miraculous ways, that you would receive all the glory and praise. So as we sing to this morning, as we worship, I pray that we'd worship like we believe you're alive, like we believe that you're real, like we believe that you're still in power, that you're still on your throne today. And so Lord, help us to sing from the heart. Help us to trust you deeper and deeper as we walk with you this week. In Jesus' name I pray.